The world around us is hostile to the Word of God and to biblical values, but we are called to be salt and light, to stand for truth in a decaying culture. We are not called to run from the fire, but be willing to step into the fire. God has placed you at this time in history on purpose and for a purpose. Join us as we get better equipped to address civics and culture from a biblical worldview. Welcome to Into the Fire, powered by Dream City Church. Let's welcome our hosts, Alice Inferno and Debbie Vandenboot. Today's topic is protecting kids in a decaying culture with Sarah Zastro, children's pastor at Dream City Church. Sarah, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. So we have a really interesting culture that has changed a lot over the last few years. And we know that this is definitely confusing to parents and it's impacting our kids. I want to go over a couple of stats really quick and then get your opinion on this. So a common sense media survey found the average age that most kids were exposed to porn is 12 years old. I I mean, that's insane to me. Uh, 15% first saw porn when they were 10 or younger. And then we go into some other stats. Just over 60% of children's uh, 6 to 10 years old were already exposed to explicit violence. We're talking about everything from in real life to TV, commercials, social media, all of those types of things uh, play an impact here, right? But what are you seeing that is different with kids compared to the last 5 to 10 years that, that's kind of going on right now? Yeah, well, our kids are finding themselves with cell phones, at much younger ages today than even five, 10 years ago, whenever my kids were were younger, right? Now kids very early have a cell phone in their hand or a cell phone in front of them. And there's so much access to social media and our kids are being targeted. They're being, you know, this stuff is being put in front of them, but they're literally being targeted um, with the pornography, with uh, violence, with just a liberal agenda, really. Right. And how do you see that? I've noticed a big difference in their focus, Mm -hmm. the way that they communicate with adults. And I think there's a lot more like they don't know how to communicate with Mm -hmm. adults and with people. So how have you seen that played out with kids? Yeah, well, because the the technology is in the really in the palm of their hand, right? You see them going to um, to different places to find their facts, to find their truths, and so you see them on you know YouTube or just googling the answers to their questions instead of going to their parents or going to um, r- adults. They're going to to what the world says. Yeah, and you and I were talking earlier about how even just the the common knowledge of the Bible is so different. Um, yeah, the, uh, how from what it was like when you and I were young, because right. and and when our kids were younger, because um, our kids are the same age range. And mm-hmm. um, what can you explain? Talk about what we were talking about earlier about that. Yeah, absolutely. So our kids now are growing up in a post Christian society, right? Our what. Our kids kind of knew, right? Our kids were raised in the church, but we grew up with these understandings of biblical knowledge of what the Bible says, whether it's, you know, uh, the, the story of Jonah in the well or David and Goliath. It, this, this knowledge that everybody knew, even if they didn't necessarily believe in God. And, but now our kids are growing up without that knowledge. We talk about the Bible, and, and they relate it sometimes with uh, with Disney, that it's like a fairy tale. It's not truth. And so... Yeah, and they've never, they've literally never heard some of those stories that we just yes. assume that they've... Right. Everyone's heard. Right. So we, yeah. as Christians and, and as, uh, you know, as a leader in children's minister, ministry, we can't take for granted that kids know these stories. We have to go back and teach them and, and really make sure that okay, we, we have to start start at the ground level and say, okay, let's start from the beginning. Let's tell you what we're talking about. Let's not assume that you understand what we're talking about. Right. And I'm sure the attention is a lot more difficult too, because now kids are used to seeing short clips of information, right? Mm-hmm. Especially with the most popular formats of videos being reels and things like that. TikTok, mm-hmm. it's like five seconds, 10 seconds, mm-hmm. and then you're done, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they're used to getting something that maybe we'd read in an entire book that takes six months to read. They're getting it in two minutes. Right. And so I think that the way that they process things, they have less patience for sure. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that a lot. They want things a lot faster 
And when they don't get it, they're like, well, what's wrong? Why can't I do it now? What, right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, there's definitely that. Um, that they want that instant gratification. Um, and so, you know, we, we've, we've talked a lot about that in children's ministry. Like, hey, we, we, you need to dive into God's word and you need to read it. And, and don't just um, expect it to come, right? You have to dig in there and search for the truths in Scripture. And so, but yeah, kids are used to just getting things instantly. And, and sometimes when they don't get the answer they want instantly, it's like, oh, well, let me go find it somewhere else. Right. So. But I love what you said about going back and teaching the basics because as people who've, you know, grew up in a different time, even I grew up in a totally different time than what kids are dealing with now, you kind of assume, well, why don't you know that as you know? Right. And, and so you have to go, okay, hold on a second. They might not have been taught any of these things, right? right. Even at this point, how to be polite, how to talk to adults, how to mm-hmm. address adults, all those different kinds of things that, yeah. like you were saying, kids used to be taught that at home. And a lot of times, right. you know, they come in with attitude problems, or they come in with with issues and we have to remember, okay, maybe you haven't been taught this yet. So, right. you know, it's a, it's a good opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, wh- one of the things that I've noticed over the, over the last really f- even five years is I have parents coming to me saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing my best to raise my child, but I need help. I don't know the basics, even, you know, just, uh, putting dinner on the table, like making meals, some of the things that we take for granted, because we, we learned those growing up. A lot of our parents today, they don't have that foundation. Yeah, that's true. So how do we, I mean, you're, you're touching on a good point here. We need to help kids and, and raise them up and make sure that we protect them, right, from mm-hmm. a lot of these things that are happening. And I want to talk about that a little bit more, but I also want to get into not just helping kids, but helping parents. Because when we right. see this with kids, we have to say, okay, it's coming from somewhere, right. right? So what can we do to help parents through a lot of the cultural stuff that's happening, especially when they don't know what their kids are being taught? Right. Yeah. And I think COVID was really eye-opening because we realized, I, for a lot of parents, they realized, okay, what what exactly are my kids learning? Like, And I think it was very eye-opening Um, I think we still have a lot of parents that aren't there yet. They're really still trying to figure out their own faith and their own walk. And so um, I've heard from many many, uh, parents that, well, I'm going to let my child decide. I'm going to let them figure it out on their own. I don't want to force religion on my child. And so, um, but what we need to do is come alongside these parents and teach them. Right. It says in Deuteronomy 11 that um, God is talking to the Israelites. Right. And he's telling them, he's like, talk to your kids about it when they're walking, when they're going to sleep, when they're, you know, doing everyday life. Mm -hmm. And and so for us as parents to say, oh, well, we'll let our kids figure it out. Right. That's in disobedience. That's not what God's word says. Um, God's word says that we're supposed to teach our kids. And so, um, but we need to come alongside our parents today and help, help guide them and help teach them too. Well, and the Bible also talks about training up, you know, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. That it's our job to do that training. And I think um, we've talked about it a little bit on other episodes of this show, but that the world is not holding back and letting kids decide they're overtly going after right. kids and yes. trying to impart those things um beliefs belief systems and worldviews mm-hmm. into the kids lives and if we're they want us to the world wants us to sit back and just let them decide for themselves because yeah. then they're the only voice that's coming right. in there the that voice that's telling them all of these things that are not true about who God is, who they are, the way that the world works. Um, So it's extremely important for parents to be engaged. But I understand why that is tempting to think, oh, you know, you're being you're being helpful by just letting them think independently. And and, but that's not the way that we're supposed to be handling those. Well, Many of those parents that feel that way, it's because they had religion pushed on them. Yeah. And so they have, they have scars and they have things that haven't healed yet. And so they don't want to do the same thing to their child. Right. Right. And so they're, they're trying to figure out their own faith and they're, they're coming back to God and and that's great. Right. But, you know, it's okay to walk through your faith 
at the same time that you're teaching your child. Yes. You can yeah. tell your child, I don't have all of the answers. I'm still figuring things out on my own too. And that's perfectly good. I mean, that's, that's, that's okay to do. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So, well, and I think you and I both, I mean, at least I, I know this is true for me and I feel like it might've been true for you if, 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 when our kids were young, when I first, I, I, I personally, I got saved and got married and had kids Mm -hmm. and I really didn't have it all figured out. I didn't know, I didn't understand. And I was learning all of that, those Bible truths when my kids were little. And so it is, it's true. You can just dive in yourself and, and do the best you can to pass that on. And God meets you where you are and, and helps with that. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, my my parents were not perfect, and you know, my my father died when I was four, and so there were times where we were in church, and there were times when we weren't in church. And so, um, when when my husband and I got married, we decided we wanted to raise our kids in church, and we've made lots of mistakes, you know, and and there we've had some successes too, but um, but by the grace of God, you know, our kids are they're believers, they're following God. And, and that's, you know, that was my biggest thing as a parent. It's like, I want to raise my kids to know and love the Lord. Yeah. So, right. And I think that's, so you guys are both saying the same thing. It's really good is just opening the word of God and reading something in the word of God. It seems so simple, but we know so many people that are in church and out of church don't read the Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I understand that because I went through a lot of years where I was just like, I don't understand this what do I read? Which book do I read? Now I would read a verse and be like, okay, this is pointless. I don't understand the whole thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, but there's so much merit to that effort. You guys both said that, that, that God, you know, is he looks at your effort and your heart in the matter. And so when you go into it, you don't have to say, oh, I totally understand the Bible and I get everything. You can just say, I know, don't know what I'm doing, right. but I'm just going to read the first verse. And I'm going to just figure it out as I go along. And I'm going to ask God for wisdom in what does this mean and how do I interpret it, right? Yeah. And rely on other experienced parents who who have been there and done that too. I think that's important too. Yeah. Having a community around you is huge, right? It's it's so important to have people that are like-minded, that have the same values as you, and that are going through this process together you know I mean Debbie and I we've known each other for for a a very long time when our kids were young they used to play together and and it was such it was so great to have that community so that when you're having challenging days you can go to someone and 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 ask for prayer and ask for help and to have someone to to help help you yeah So let's talk about the current parent culture right now. So parents that have young children, there is a very common theme across the the mainstream media, which still controls a lot of people, right? And uh, I saw something a couple months ago, and this has been going on for a while, where parents have, I mean, there's commercials and ads and influencers that have explicit jokes about how annoying their six-month-old baby is and how it's a pain for them to have to feed their children and how they've given up enough time because you've already ruined my body and you've already done this. And like, Mm -hmm. they look at kids so often as like a pest Mm -hmm. and it's very off-putting. I'm like, how could you think of your little kid like that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, how could you literally, but it's such a self-centered culture that Mm -hmm. revolves around the idea of, I should be making myself happy and that mm-hmm. it doesn't really include anybody else. So how do we address something like this? What does the Bible say about this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've heard that from from young adults, newly married couples that have said, I don't know if I'm ready because they've been scared a little bit from the culture that's portraying parenthood as being terrible. Right. Being not, you know, not a, a, a great thing to do. And and the, the reality is, is that a lot of people that are saying that don't actually mean it. Right. I, I mean, I think there probably are people that do mean that. <laughs> yeah. But but many of them are saying it because they think it's funny and because they, um, you know, they're just trying to make people laugh. And so I think, you know, I think the majority of people that have had children really do believe that their child has has changed them for the good. You right. know, parenting is a blessing, 
right? It says that, um, it says in the Bible, right? It talks about the blessing of being a parent and, and having a, a, a home full of kids is a blessing. And so we need to, we need to flip the script yeah. and start telling Absolutely. the truth and not, you know, not uh, give in to the jokes or the humor that parenting is this negative, this bad thing, that it ruins your body and you have no time for anything else. So. And it's even just like the mommy wine culture thing where it's like, okay, they need to have their wine to deal with the their child. You know, it, th- those, all of that, there's just so much of that, what you were talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, and I agree with you. I don't think people think about it. They think that they're being funny and they're dealing with it. Okay. Parenting is, is hard. It is a hard job, but it is so, it is more valuable and more worthwhile than anything else I've ever done in my entire life. And I think that most people do feel that way. They they understand the value and the importance that you have a, a a child that you is part of you, and you get to mold that child's life and help direct them, and and that God's gifted you with that that opportunity to do that. Um, but I think that we don't realize in a lot of ways, and this is one of the biggest ones in in this parenting thing, but we don't realize the impact of our words. Right. It's that you know right. speaking life and death. And so yeah. when we're talking about younger teenagers or young adults who have not been married and had kids and they're thinking why would I want to do that why would I want to get married if it's just terrible and you know all all everybody does is fight or get have kids and be tied down and not be able to do anything and um that we we really especially as seasoned parents and and it's our duty and our obligation to really just pour life I think with our words into into younger people and and no it's not it's it's a blessing yes it's tough there are seasons where you don't sleep a lot there are seasons where it's rough like there's there are but it is so worth it like every minute of it is worth it mm-hmm. it, it is and 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 it's important for people to hear that because we do have a much lower rate of of um having kids and the 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 child rate has gone down and marriage and i mean although i, I am encouraged that there's a lot of younger people that are getting married young. Yeah. We know a lot of them, a lot of young adults that are getting married in their early twenties. And I think it's a good, healthy shift in the culture personally. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's so interesting because it, it does, there's, there is a lot of negativity fueled around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to your point, when you bring that into the church, it's not necessarily negative, but it's like, they're scared, right? right? Mm-hmm. Like this is something that my life's going to be over when this happens mm-hmm. or, You know, so I I think it's really interesting and I completely agree about shifting that narrative back because that that family is your support system, right? Like it is Mm -hmm. your home base. And I think that's why politically it's it's a target to be destroyed because if you can if you can take out the strongest base that someone has, you can disable them from being able to be. Uh, a really powerful and strong thing in society. So um, from a political standpoint, if you want people to be on food stamps, if you want them to be helpless, you will try to take away the family. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a a key thing politically that we see is that why would we, why are there apartment buildings continuously being built? Why is it encouraged to stay single and to sleep with people and to, you know, this like hookup culture? Why is that pushed so heavily? Because, you stay lonely, you stay vulnerable, you stay by yourself, and you want assistance mm-hmm. from the government if you yeah. get to that point where, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and also with that, added to that, not only that that vulnerability, but also because, I mean, God so clearly through all, all of the Word of God, He thinks generationally. Right. He talks about the generations and the future generations and your children's children and their mm-hmm. children. And if you don't have that, you are more selfish naturally. You're just yeah. more mm-hmm. selfish because the only person you're thinking about is you, right? But if you have a family and you have children, then all of a sudden, I mean, that's we had a conversation, you and I, Allison, one, uh, about having, that's part of why I got involved in the political arena and in the civic arena was because of having kids, because it all of a sudden mattered to me. It was important to know what what kind of a legacy, what, what future I was leaving to my kids in, right. in the state, in the city. And so those things, you do start to think outside of yourself in a good way when you have kids. Right. Well, and I think it also has, it, it creates, uh, you, you value human life more when you see the whole process. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, if, if your life was only for you for the amount of years that you're going to be here and there was nothing you were thinking about after that, you know, it's a totally different perspective. 
because, and this is what a lot of younger people think about. Why not screw people over? Because it doesn't matter. I'm going to do whatever I want, right? Like it's it's a very self-centered culture Mm -hmm. that revolves around a limited lifespan that has nothing after it and nothing before it that you consider. And I think that's a big part of the negative effects. That's That's why there's so much hurt and pain and a lot of self-inflicted suffering in our culture because people continuously hurt each other. Yeah. And, and that's something that, you know, seeing the bigger picture of the family and of the, the legacy, like you're saying of generations. And I think about that. I'm like, okay, once I have kids, what can they do? And then what can that, you know, and then let's like, how, how much can you leave for them and have for them for the future? You know, how can you build for future generations? I think that's something that more people should think about. Yeah. Um, because you live your life well, you, differently. You touched on something, Allison. You said um, when we have a strong family, we have a strong society. Yes. Right? And that that's so huge. That's so important, right? That's that's what they're afraid of, right? That's why they want to um, d- undermine our, our family units. And so we need to make be building up strong families. And in our church too, right? We want to have strong and healthy families in our church, right? Because then we have a, a healthy, a vibrant church that's doing, you know, doing good things and they're reaching out to others. And so, um, you know, just trying to uh, just be there for those families and just kind of help support them um, just makes such a huge impact. And it's going to make a huge impact here in the state of Arizona. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So now let's go to, you are currently leading a parenting class at Dream City Church. Can you talk about what kinds of things that you are teaching parents? Yes. Um, So my husband and I are both, we're co-leading the class together, um, which has been a lot of fun, but it's, um, our class is called Sticky Faith. And Mm -hmm. so really what we're trying to teach parents is that they need to help instill a strong faith in their kids and what that looks like to have a sticky faith, a, a faith that's going to last them um, through through middle school, through high school and beyond, whatever they choose to do, whether they choose to go off to college or if they choose to, you know, start a family or create a business or whatever that is, right? We want our kids' faith to stick, right? The rate of our kids that are growing up in the church and then when they become adults, they're leaving the church is, it's, well, 10 years ago, it was 50%, right? I think that statistic is probably higher today. But these are kids that are raised in the church. Right. And the, their faith doesn't stick for whatever reason. And so we really want to teach parents to um, help develop a faith in their kids that's going to stick. That's awesome. And what can, I mean, we're talking about this connection of we've got kids that are troubled and then we've got parents that are dealing with all these different things going on in culture. What can parents do to be more involved with their kids? What advice would you give to parents to be more involved? Yeah. Have open lines of communication, listening to what your your kids going through, right? Sometimes it can be very difficult. So, especially if you try to start this when your kids are older, if you start it when your kids are young and develop a relationship where they can have open communication, they can talk to you about whatever they're going through, whether it's, you know, something you don't want to hear as a parent, <laughs> right. which happens sometimes, right? But you have to be able to to listen to your child and not react and and let them share with you what's happening, what's going on and guide them through those the things that they're facing and the struggles they go through. Yeah, I agree. Debbie, what do you think? Yeah, so I was thinking when you were saying that, I mean, some of the best times that we had when my kids were little were talking on the way home from church Mm -hmm. in the car on a Wednesday night, talking about just whatever was on their minds instead of having a TV on or whatever in the car to be talking. Yeah, for sure. And I think something that I see a lot now with parents that destroys kids is when the kid is looking for attention and the parent is on their phone, but trying to talk to the kid, Mm. they're divided. Right. So, and I've seen kids act out like this when I'm coaching, right? Like the kids will say like, mom, I want you to watch me. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm watching, but they have their phone up the entire time. Mm -hmm. And the kids know if the parents are not giving their full attention and it is not good, especially with younger kids. They really, 
you know, they're looking for that approval and that acceptance and they, uh, kids want to have that conversation with their parents. So, um, I think being present is another huge one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is huge. Right. And, and I know we live in a, a very busy society and there's a lot happening, but intentionally carving out time, whether it's daily, one of the things we always did when our kids were little was we had family dinners every night. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, sometimes that family dinner looked like picking up takeout and eating it all together. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, but we tried to have that time together where we could all sit down. We could talk about what happened in our day. You know, the kids would tell yeah. us their highs and lows. And, you know, a lot of times we would do devotions um, at dinner time as well. But, it just gave us a time to just be present, like you were saying, with one another. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and just building those those routine, those um, not a routine, but but those moments that are predictable, right? So it's whether right. they're around holidays, even those some of those things that are special that the kids count on every year, dinners, um, you know, game night, whatever those things are, where you're intentionally building those memories and those connections are really important. I mean, we still, my kids are, my youngest is a senior in high school, about to graduate, but we still will have, you know, family game night or family dinner and, and everybody comes over and their friends come over and they'll, they're, they want to bring other people to that too, which I, it's my favorite thing in the whole world. <laughs> I, I love it, but I, because I want that connection to continue and that it's a good healthy, fun thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's so important. And one of the things that we we try to communicate to our parents is not every family's the same, right? My The things that we do with our family and our kids might look different than yes. what you do with your family. Yeah. And that's okay, right? You got to find what works best for your family. and and But then just make it a habit. Like yes, make right. sure you plan it. If that means putting it in your schedule, blocking out that time, Whatever it takes to make sure that you're teaching your kids that they're a priority to you. Yeah. And and that really, you know, goes a really a long way. Well, and that's so true, too, because, I, you know, different people, like, they might go hiking together or play a right. sport or do, um, you know, something more active or outdoors or, you know, read a book all together at the same time and talk about it or, or have a movie night or have a game night or whatever it is that your family likes to do. It doesn't have to be anything in particular. It really is just that you're a priority, our family's a priority, we're going to spend time together and build those relationships and have that so that we can have those conversations when, you know, when they're needed and and when we want to have those conversations and just enjoy being together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So last question here, what types of activities can kids do over the summer? What are some things going on that parents can put their kids in that is going to be super helpful for them. Yeah, because we have months of, right, no school and depending yeah. on what your schooling is. So it's a really prime time to get started if you haven't already. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We have a lot of things here at Dream City Church. Um, we have Vacation Bible School at um, at our different Valley campuses. And so parents can go to the Glendale campus for VBS. Then they can come to the Phoenix campus for a different VBS we also are doing a Next Genesis conference this year, hosted at the Scottsdale campus, which is going to be our first ever um, kids conference. And so we're really excited about that. And um, and really, that's going to be kind of a camp experience for our kids. Our kids get to come and hear the word of God and, and um, very much like <coughs> they would at kids camp, um, but they don't, they're not sleeping over. So, mm -hmm. um, and then we also do have kids camp too, that we do in July. And so, but it, wherever you're at, whether you're here locally at the Phoenix campus, we would love for you to come here and check us out. But if you're somewhere else, find what your church church has locally that's going on. Um, when our kids were little, a lot of times they would go to multiple VBSs at different, our different friends, churches and stuff. And, and so it was just a great way to help build their faith and um, get to check out other things. So, Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. And thank you for listening to Into the Fire, powered by Dream City Church. You can listen to this podcast on Apple and Spotify and follow us on social media. Find all the info on the show notes. To learn more about Dream City Church, visit our website at dreamcitychurch.us. Thanks for listening.